as we look around the church today, uh, sincere and joyful thanks to all the people who were here to decorate the church this weekend. Magnificent job. God bless you all. This week we have a number of birthdays. Uh, Keith Sundermeyer on the 28th. Brittany Dixon on the 30th. Carrie Godfrey on the December the 2nd. And Eric Linhart on December the 4th. Happy birthday to all of you and may God bless you on that special day and throughout the year to come. We also wish a happy anniversary to Cody and Brittany Panning who were married on the 30th of November in 2013. So congratulations to them as well. I was asked to also mention that we need readers uh, for the month of December. So if you're available to read the lessons or be part of the service for Advent uh, activities, please sign up. Um, I have a number of people uh, to ask you to keep in your prayers. They're on the list. Those that are affected by natural disasters, um, our military service personnel, especially during these holiday season. Uh, I also would ask that you pray for all the, the medical people and the EMTs and firemen and police that support them. I, I spent some time this weekend uh, on the phone with uh, uh, the emergency room at Bay Park and also in Maumee, and I was told the same thing. Pastor, please don't go out. We've got people parked in the parking lot waiting. It's a madhouse. So, along with praying for these people, also please do whatever you can to stay healthy because it's getting bad again. And may God take care of all of you and all those who are part of this medical system. There's a number of other announcements in here. Um, I'd invite you to read your bulletin carefully. Things are coming up every day. Finally, on a very good note, congratulations to Carrie and Kane Godfrey on the birth of Gatlin Michael Godfrey on November the 18th. Uh, congratulations to also the grandparent mentors. See, God still acts in blessings and wonderful ways to us all. With that, unless there are other announcements. Uh, hey, hello. Okay, so um, I had a note somewhere saying I think we filled up our angel tree, uh, the gift giving tree for um, our children. But as you say, there is one at the bank now. Okay, so again, thank you for your generosity in this ministry. And uh, if you would care to go to the bank and also continue that, God bless you again. Well, unless there are other announcements, let's begin our worship. Good morning. Advent is about the coming days. God's people have always lived in great expectation, but that expectation finds specific, repeated enunciation in the texts appointed for these four weeks. The ancients anticipated a righteous branch to spring up for David. The Thessalonians awaited the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Jesus' contemporaries hoped for the time to stand before the Son of Man. With them, we eagerly await the coming days. Another Christmas celebration, a second coming, and the advent of Christ in word and supper. Today, we light the first candle of the advent wreath. This is the candle of hope. With Christians around the world, we use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. 
Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Let us join in prayer together. Lord, as we look to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us to become lights lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our hope. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God for whom we wait. In the presence of one another, we confess our sin before you. We fail in believing that your good news is news for us. We falter in our call to tend your creation. We find our sense of self in material wealth. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget that we are your children and turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one, and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Christ Jesus has looked with favor upon us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, our sins are forgiven. We are children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise, and recipients of divine mercy. God strengthens us anew to follow the way of peace. Amen. We continue with the opening hymn. Oh, 
Jesus now appear Arise, O sun, so long for O'er this benighted sphere With hearts and hands uplifted We plead, O Lord, to see A day of its redemption Let set your The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Let us join our hearts and pray together. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the warrant-threatening dangers of our sins, and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God. Today's first reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. In the Old Testament, righteousness often has to do with being faithful in relationship. God acts righteously both in punishing Israel for its sin and in having mercy. In today's reading, Jerusalem's future name, the Lord is our righteousness, proclaims that God is even now working salvation for Israel. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. We'll read the Psalms responsively. Uh, Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. Our second reading is taken from First Theologians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Upon Timothy's return from the congregation at Thessalonica, Paul is exuberant with gratitude for them. In the passage from his letter, Paul voices overflowing thanks, joy, and blessings for the people of this growing church. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father, himself, and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Word of God, word of life. The 
Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 21st chapter, beginning at the 25th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I was surprised to, to notice, um, actually it was brought to my attention, that uh, the author, Charles Dixonson, or Dixon, had written at one time that if you raise up a fig tree in the way it should grow, that when you are old you can sit in the shadow of it and enjoy the evening breezes. <laughs> Boy, that sounded familiar. Probably because it's a paraphrase of what Solomon had written years and years before when he said, Take up a ch raise up a child in the way he should grow, and when he is old, he will not forget his lessons. Hmm. Oddly enough, uh, Dixon, or Dickens never was called out for this um, plagiarism. I suspect that in those days, just as today, people had Bibles, but very few read them. And so, how would they know, or why would they care? And you might also wonder, why are we talking about it this morning? But the truth is, these two stories, one about raising up a tree so that someday you can be seated under it, and raising up a child so that one day you can watch him take his place in society as a Christian and doing what is right have things in common. Both require a great deal of long-term planning. This isn't something you do overnight and then walk away. Both of them require constant attention over time. And both of them are very rewarding. So let's compare the business of growing a tree with raising a Christian. In both cases, you need either to pick a tree or to take a child. And with the tree, you have to dig a hole and plant it and fill the hole, which is much bigger than the ball of, of uh, roots, with soft dirt so that the roots have a place to expand in the next year or so and develop paths of nourishment. You have to water it constantly and fertilize it. You have to make sure that it grows. With a child, we do the same kind of thing. The planting is called baptism, where we bring the child before the congregation and bathe him in the Holy Spirit. And then that child is given that loose soil, that support that it can develop to grow through the parents and the godparents and the grandparents and especially the congregation around him. They provide that 
not only that foundation, but also the nourishment, the interesting, it's the things they need to know. In the church especially, we feed the child, we water it and fertilize it with the Word of God in Sunday school and church. Some of you might say the fertilizer part is probably the sermon. But in any case, the child begins to grow and develop and become a Christian child. We raise up the child in the way he would go. But especially for a young tree, it's more than just throwing some water on the ground or it's a fertilizer. There, there's pruning. There's these suckers that grow up straight and rob the tree of its nourishment and also of its perfect shape. And so we have to trim those off. There are diseases that may show up that you have to spray for. You may have to protect it from animals like deer that want to eat the leaves away. The same is true in the young Christian. As a parent, you have to prune away so many of the really bad influence that the child suffers. Maybe it's kids in school, or things on the television, or stuff that they choose to read. It's a difficult responsibility for a parent to raise up a child in the way that he grows as a Christian. The rewards, though, are that the child becomes upright. What, what Isaiah talks about as righteous. He knows what's right and wrong. Maybe the best thing you can feed that child, the best way you can protect him better than spraying him for diseases and bugs is to show him an example. To raise the child in a way that you know is right. To show them how Christians act and live and love. A, a child that's brought to church every Sunday by his parents hopefully grows to learn this is like a family. This is a place I go, and this is a good thing. And as they grow older, I mean, there's always that teenage years when things go a little crazy. The Amish call it the rumschlag. But afterwards, as Solomon says, they'll be back. They will not depart from what they have been taught and especially what they have been shown. Now, as the tree reaches maturity, our responsibilities to maintain it decrease. Oh, yeah, you still prune it a bit and fertilize it. It's, it's the maintenance things. If there are diseases or bugs, you spray. But by and large, it's pretty much on its own. The same is true of a Christian. There, there is maintenance that needs to be done, of course, in every Christian life. That maintenance includes regular worship and prayer, Bible study, all the things that strengthen you in your faith. And finally, the rewards. At some point, after a just and righteous life, we return to our God. And God looks upon us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come into my kingdom and rest. There's one thing in between those two that I didn't mention. Something where we separate and differ from the trees. Trees are wise enough not to have doubts. Trees are wise enough not to be indifferent. Trees are wise enough to, tra to stay being trees. That's not always so for the Christian. We have, at times, situations where maybe our, our faith is tested. Like a tree, death in a family, for example, can almost destroy a tree, like lightning hitting a tree. Loss of a loved one can damage a Christian very much. And like any good gardener, you have to really work sometimes to recover that tree. And as a good congregation, sometimes you have to really work to help and comfort and recover the person who is grieving. Sickness and disease and 
infirmities can do the same thing. And again, they need this encouragement from one another. From They need the skills of the medical world. They need, though, most of all, a faith that God is there and with them. And that's where that doubt comes in. Where is God when times are hard? And the answer is God is where he always is, right beside you, comforting you, guiding you, giving you the strength to endure. Somehow that doesn't seem like enough when you're in the middle of something painful. But at the other time, I've always thought, where would you be without God? Where else can you turn? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Our problem with indifference, though, is, is very much like some of the lessons here. We've been doing this thing about preparing for the coming of Christ for a long, long time. And over time, we sometimes become indifferent. We lose our motivation. We don't have that enthusiasm. That's why they put Advent into the calendar. This is a time for you to renew your faith that Christ is coming, to rebuild that enthusiasm for the second coming of Christ, to make yourself ready every day. I know it's sometimes not easy, but imagine God isn't playing a wait a couple of days and this will happen. We're a society that demands instant gratification, and yet you have to remember, God took 400 years just to send out the announcements that his son was coming to this earth. For us, as we spend every day serving God in the church and in our communities, we are preparing the way of the Lord, preparing for the coming of Christ. And this is that time of year through these lessons where we build ourselves back up to do that job through the rest of the year. We do that by, by looking at the Bible verses. Jeremiah's lesson today, I mean, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Micah, all talked about the coming of Christ. And if every one of you have an Advent calendar, please look, open each day's lesson and read that and see the promise God has made. And when you read the promises God makes to his people, remember something from this first lesson that talks about righteousness. So often we look at righteousness as being right. <laughs> God is right. He does what's right. He defines what's right. But in Advent terms, righteousness has a special kind of doing what is right. A right that has to deal with being trustworthy, being dependable, being honest. God is dependable and honest. If he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And he says, my son will return. In fact, the words we recite every week was, he will come again to judge the quick or living and the dead. And if you like the Nicene Creed, you can throw in that, and his kingdom will have no end, which is pretty reassuring to me. Every Advent, as you read these lessons or hear them read in the Sunday with lessons, every week as you say the creed, think about a God who is righteous in terms of dependable, trustworthy. Yeah, it's going to happen. Christ will come again. And prepare for that. I think that's the biggest problem with indifference. Yeah, well, look, I don't think Jesus is going to be coming back to earth today or probably tomorrow. Maybe not even in my lifetime, I suppose. Sure hasn't yet. I just got to go on doing what I do and living like, you know, living in the world the way it is. And, you know, we'll worry about him later. Later may be too late because you never know. Advent is that time when you realize whether he comes today, tomorrow, or in a thousand years, I want to be ready. Imagine a guard on duty saying, I doubt if they'll attack today. I think I'll just 
put my rifle back there in the locker, walk my post looking around. There should probably be nothing happening. As a guard, you wouldn't last very long. As a Christian, your faith won't last very long if you assume that I can always pick it up sometimes later. So in this Advent season, I want you to look at those lessons. I want you to see the candles and hear words like hope and faith and love. And I want you to use those to ignite this sense that Christ is coming for me. Christ will come again and claim me as his child. This week, as we walk into the season of Advent, please do so with, with prayers. Maybe read some of these old prophecies. Maybe check yourself over to see how prepared am I, how willing am I to continue to be the Christian that parents and friends and congregation has helped me develop into being. You've had all the preparation in the world. You've lived the job all this time. To the Christian and every one of you, all I can say is keep up the good work. Be renewed this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue with the hymn. confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. God of presence and peace, strengthen your church around the globe to proclaim the message of your love coming to the world. Open our hearts to recognize your face in all people and in all of your creation. Hear us, O God. God of mighty redwoods and microscopic plants, fields and city parks, the wind and the waves, be a healing balm to our wounded planet, 
May we nurture what you have lovingly created. Hear us, O God. God of equity and compassion, bring righteousness and goodness to all people of the earth. Give a heart of discernment and integrity to leaders in our communities. Hear us, O God. God of comfort and care, be present with those who watch and wait. Come to all who await births, deaths, divorces, new unions, new jobs, retirements, healing, and life transitions of every kind. Hear us, O God. God of promises kept and new dreams awakened, shelter your people from destructive storms. We pray for those whose lives have been upended by natural disasters, for the work of Lutheran Disaster Response and Lutheran World Relief and other relief organizations. Hear us, O God. God, you sent your Son Jesus to rule in all times and places. We pray for the friends of our congregations who are unable to join our worship in person and for all who are sick and suffering, especially Anna, Bill Heber, Russ Welling, Chuck and Janet Selby, Melissa Briggs, Steve Roosh, Doris Rothenbuehler, Jim Bruggemeyer, Kendra Wolf, Cindy Borshading, Nicole Kirian, Ed Bro, Jane Roosh, Donna Morlock, and Lauren Lavoy. Join their prayers with ours and unite them in our body of Christ. Hear us, O God. God of compassion and community, we give you thanks for the saints who journeyed with us and now abide in you. Even in distress and uncertainty, make us confident that your promises endure forever. Hear us, O God. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. We continue with the offering. waiting and watching, we offer the gifts of our hearts and our lives to the service of all your people. Prepare the way before us as we meet you in this simple meal, through Jesus Christ our Lord, our pathway and our peace. Amen. Together let us offer to God the prayer his Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the God of hope fill us all with joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ for whom we wait. Amen. and God of glory on your behalf. 
people pour your power round your ancient church's story. Bring its buds to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving you whom we adore, serving you whom we together our mission statement connecting to Christ connecting to one another connecting Christ to the community and the world go in peace prepare the way of the Lord thanks be to God Amen <laughs>